very, very, very uh, unique training that is required for an animal to work on set. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to look at animals in movies, how animals get cast, the unique training that they have to have, and working with exotic animals on set. Our guest has worked on more than 100 movies, TV shows, and commercials in nearly a 20-year career. This is Hollywood animal agent and animal trainer, Joel Norton. Thanks for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. How big of an industry is this? Are there a couple of people doing it, or is this a lot bigger than I would think? I would say there's probably 20 animal rental companies that exist in America. How does it kind of work? The studio comes to you, hey, we've got this. What do you got? Yeah, exactly. The studio comes to us with a project. Uh, a lot of times they'll have a script or a board or a breakdown, and they'll say, hey, look, there's a dog in this scene. Um, here is the script. Here's what the dog needs to do. Um, and here's kind of what we're looking for. Um, sometimes they're very specific. You know, we want a Dalmatian. It has to be a Dalmatian. It's for a, a fire a house, whatever. Sometimes they're extremely vague. We just want a dog. And they don't give any other notes other than that. Here's the dogs that we have that fit the look that you want, whether it be that Dalmatian or a family dog or whatever the look is. And then we send that off to them. And then they make their decision based on that email. If they like the dogs and they like the numbers, um, then they book that dog and we take the dog on set and work it. And if they don't like any of the dogs, then then they move on and, and look at, for another company. Is it a kind of like a casting process like an actor? I mean, are they actually like... Not over pictures. It's all, it's all pictures and email. It's not... The, the days of like we all show up in one area and they all look at about that that doesn't exist really anymore um rarely will they still do a showing for a big project where they really want to get a feel for it but that is exceedingly rare i haven't done one personally in in over a decade um everything's just done on the web you know if they want to see more details they'll say hey can we get a quick video of, of fido so we can kind of see how it works or can we see a, a project that's already done a finished product and I'll send them a YouTube clip, and that's it. Why did it kind of get like that? Was it just because, like, there's so many animals involved now that, like, we just got to we gotta oh, turn this out? No, no, it's just convenience. It, 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 it costs money and time and energy to load up dogs from, from all the different companies and wherever they're located and drive to a central location and, and do that. And we would charge for that. It, it costs money for us to, to drive and to load up animals and everything else. And so as soon as email became a common thing, that was – gonna start fading itself out almost immediately act even actors i think do a lot of self-tapes now where they record themselves and send it in they they don't go to a room when they have a little camera there so everything has changed with technology is now like for most of the projects are we talking about like hey we're shooting a commercial for blah 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 or are we talking yeah. about like it's a new movie like air bud or something like yeah that? it's it's all done the same I really, uh, you know, if it is a big, big thing with Airbud and they really care about, you know, actor chemistry or something like that, those are the times that, yeah, we might, we'll still narrow, we'll still originally send, you know, the pictures and the videos and all those other things. And then they'll make their, you know, maybe final two. And then from there, they will, okay, we'll, we'll actually see these dogs in person and get a feel for which one we like best or whatever. And someone will make that decision. But Honestly, even for big projects, big TV shows, big movies, it's all done over the web, over the internet. What are they generally kind of looking for? That's a good question. I, I don't know. Oftentimes, I don't know exactly what they're looking for. I don't even think they know a lot of times what they're looking for. They just know they want a dog in the scene um, and they have an idea of a look. You know, if it's if it's a family scene and it's a, you know, a vacuum commercial or whatever, then they'll obviously want a dog with longer fur. Or if it's a dog that's just blended in with a family, they're going to pick a, what most people would think of as a family-looking dog. So, you know, a, when you see a German Shepherd, you don't think of a family dog. You think of a police dog. When you see, you know, whatever, you know, that that is kind of what their main objective is, is to fill whatever look that they want. But as far as, you know, all the dogs come trained, all that kind of stuff. So it really just whatever that, particular director producer art department whatever they want is what they uh, you know I, I've had dogs hired because the director had that breed when he was a kid and he just wanted to see it again 
in person on set. And that was the sole reason that that breed was picked. I guess I thought it would be more complicated than that. I thought that there would be somebody like, yeah. no, no, no. This golden retriever's coat isn't quite what we really wanted. Can you get us a- right? No, that, I mean, the, do those th- do those times exist? Sure, you know, there's always. But again, ninety nine percent of the time, it, it is it is not that complicated. Honestly, over ninety five percent of the time, a single picture is all that they they go off of. A single picture. I mean, I'm attaching twenty five pictures to an email, but from there, they will nail it down to the dog that they want based on a picture. How does the kind of the the business side of it necessarily work? I know you guys are a rental company. Do you own, who owns the dogs? So are they that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. So our company is, is unique. Our company, Hollywood Paws, is, is sort of one of a kind in that the vast majority of our working dogs, the dogs that we take on set, they are owned by people. They're private party dogs. Um, the other studio rental companies, they all own their own animals. So they have large ranches and kennels and places, uh, you know, in the high desert and stuff. And all those animals are housed and owned by them. And they will take the animals out on set and work them. But our company uh, does things a little bit differently. We, we keep the dogs with the pet owners. Um, sometimes we're called a green agency for that, for that reason. Um, but, you know, it just means that the dogs stay with an owner and then we pick them up from the owner. We take the dog on set and then the owner gets the money rather than the money staying within the company. Um, what we are sort of responsible for is making sure that that pet owner keeps up the very, very, very uh, unique training that is required for an animal to work on set. How, okay, so a company that operates in a different way when they own it, like they'll own... Yeah. Five do- five animals, or how many animals oh, do they yeah. own? Uh, a lot, yeah, a lot more than a lot more than five. Um, you know the you because you have to have variety. You have to have the goal for sort of every rental company is to have like one of every look. And so I would say an average of that is like maybe fifteen to twenty minimum dogs. You know we never know what job calls are going to come in tomorrow. We never know what looks are going to be requested. So a company wants to have a couple small dogs, a couple medium sized dogs a couple big dogs. They want to have a bunch of family dogs. They want to have some more aggressive looking dogs. If they get, you know, dogs supposed to guard a junkyard, you got to have a Rottweiler. You know, you want to have a variety. Otherwise, you're not going to book anything. You talked a little bit about like the training aspect of it. Mm -hmm. What kind of training would an an animal that's going to work in Hollywood need? That's probably the most unique thing that that people don't understand um, is studio work has a, a, a set of very unique challenges. So um, the easiest thing to compare it to is, is agility. Most people are familiar with agility. They've seen the dogs do the weave poles and the tear totters and all those obstacles. Um, a lot of the behaviors that we train a dog to do to work on set, they don't really have any purpose in the real world. So not many people know how to train them and, and don't train them because it's, it's sort of pointless. The same way that teaching your dog weave poles, if you're not going to compete in agility, nobody teaches their dog how to do weave poles because what's the point? Um, We train, there's like 30 behaviors, I would say, that are required um, for us to be able to call a dog a studio dog. There's, you know, all these different types of marks. There's like four different marks, a general mark, a come mark, a go mark. There's these things called aim sticks, you know, back up and feed up. Some more common things that people are familiar with on your side and head up and head down. Um, And then things that most people would never even have heard of, like a work away or a go to and a go with or an aim stick. Um, and those are all behaviors that, you know, aren't, aren't necessarily that hard or complicated to teach, although some of them can be, um, but they are just very unique. And their, their sole purpose is to overcome the challenges that we face on set. Um, we face a lot of challenges on set as far as having to work from really far away. Um, you know, obviously, we as the trainer, we can't be in the shot. The dog is way in the middle of the scene. And most people don't train their dogs like that. Most people don't put their dog in a position, move 20 feet away, and then start to train. But that's what we do because we can't be in the shot. So the dog has to get used to not creeping forward and staying in one spot. Um, If the uh, production is running sound, let's say, you know, and the actor's talking, I can't be in the thing going, speak, sit, stay, good, stay, while the actor's talking. You know, I have to make the dog do everything silently. Otherwise, my dialogue is going to step all over the actor's dialogue. So we teach our dogs to do everything just on hand signals. Um, A lot of times the dog can't see us on set. So 
the line of sight isn't very clear. So we teach dogs to, uh, to do what's called a work away, where they look at something else. Uh, they look at the actor. They look at a prop. They look at a green screen. But they are still listening to us, even though the dog can't see us. But there's all of these behaviors that we teach that are they're all geared to overcome, again, the challenges that we face on set, because there, there's a lot of them. You know, on set is long days, repetitive action. They'll do the same scene 20 times, and the dog has to do it the exact same way on take one as on take 20. Otherwise, it's not, it's not going to match. That is interesting, right? Because I think like I have a dog and I've taught it how to sure. sit and how to roll over. Yep. But if I'm not within like a foot of her, she's not yeah. doing it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And because you haven't practiced and you haven't trained that and you haven't made that a priority. And that's, that's most pet dogs. And so that's where, like I was saying earlier, our challenge comes in is because we work with pet dogs. We work with dogs that are owned by people like yourself. But the challenge is, is, is what we do and what the, the owners that choose to do this do is they have to keep up on that training. They have to put in the work. Uh, a studio dog is, is, is really hired for its training ability. It can be the best looking dog and it can match the dog they have in the script and all this other stuff. But if it can't do what's required on set, it's not going to work. Um, sure. but have you seen instances where like, man, we hired this dog and it's just – Oh, we got to, it's um, not working every, Oh, rarely. Yes. And it's one of those things where I have been hired. They, they originally like, I hear about it when I'm hired to do reshoots because, you know, some producer is like, well, I've got a dog or, you know, someone, I've got a dog. We'll save money. I don't want to pay thousands of dollars to have a professional dog here. My dog can sit. And then, so they try it with their own dog or whatever the case. And the dog just can't do it, you know? It, the dog literally just completely bombs and doesn't do it. And then they have to turn around and I mean, it costs them. I can't even imagine how much it costs to do it, but then they learn their lesson the hard way. And then never again, will they ever not hire a professional one. How much money are we generally talking about? And obviously I know it depends on the project, but like in terms of, right. okay, the animal is going to get paid this much for like a commercial major movie, small movie. Sure. So uh, right, right there, that's another real common misconception is the price is the same, whether it's a commercial or a feature film or a student film, none of the prices doesn't, don't, don't change. Prices are all the same. So nobody, no one makes any more. In fact, a lot of times uh, if there's a buyout or something like that, like we agree to, we agree to hire your dog for the whole season, the price goes down, not up. Um, but the, uh, to answer your question, um, dog rental is about 500 bucks a day. And they're rented on a 24 hour period. Uh, trainers, uh, we have, you know, union rates and things like that, that we go out on. Um, and then we have transportation fees. Um, any job that is unique or, or special or something like that, we oftentimes will charge prep fees. Um, so it can range from 1500 bucks a day for a real, you know, basic, simple shoot. What if there's multiple trainers on set, you know, the dog has to be released from a room and enter another room and then look up in the corner that takes two trainers, one to release the dog, one to pull the eye contact to make it look like they're looking up in the corner at an actor or whatever it is. And now your price goes up because now you have two trainers. Um, so all these little factors will, will affect the price. But I would say like a baseline minimum doesn't get really cheaper than is around 1500 bucks for the day. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't depend on like if this is the next James Cameron or if this is a commercial for Bob's nope. used cars. Absolutely. Nope, it does not. But well, one, because we, we have a, we're a union, animal trainers are in union, so that our, our rate doesn't really go up or down very much because that, so that set. Transportation is based on mileage and gas prices, so that set. And dog rental is sort of set by the industry. That makes sense, right? And ultimately, you and, make your money by days booked, not necessarily. Good, exactly, exactly. And the other thing is that, you know, there's a lot of dogs out there. Uh, I mean, there's, there's kind of a, um, it's a famous story, but uh, a lot of people know the dog that was in Modern Family. It, it was a different dog. They switched dogs halfway through the series. You, know, you, can, you can Google it. Have, have fun with that. But yeah, it's a different dog because dogs are replaceable. You didn't notice, and it's a completely different dog. So if I was to, again, have this dog and say, oh, my golden retriever has a prettier coat. It's going to cost you 5000 a day. They'll just find another golden retriever. How much will like, okay, so like, let's say a dog that's making, like it's working regularly. Uh, that dog would be in how many things a, a year? 
that there boy that totally varies it it de- it totally depends on the dog I, we have dogs that work one day a year and we have dogs that work once a month minimum and that's why you want to have a variety we don't have one superhero dog that you know because no watch tv you don't see a golden retriever in three out of five commercials you just see dogs you know there's a huge variety of, of the dogs so none of them are are quote unquote superstars or you know crazy you know insane you know this is our money maker because you that's not how productions work in fact if a dog becomes too famous they're not going to choose it they won't want a dog that you recognize from another commercial because you'll be thinking about that other commercial oh that's true right yeah yeah that's true so how did yep. you find yeah. yourself in this so i uh, that's another question uh, i went to, uh, I studied uh, uh, animal science in, in regular four-year college, and then I went to a, a school called EDEM, which stands for Exotic Animal Training and Management. Um, that's a two-year school that uh, kids go to, adults go to, um, that teaches you how to work with animals in the animal industry. So it, it's everything from zookeeping to sea world. I mean, any, it literally almost anything in the animal field that school prepares you for because it gives you ha- two years of hands-on experience, which is what people really want. Uh, a four-year degree uh, was great, but I had zero experience and nobody wanted to hire me. So, and um, I was a hand out of my class of about 50 kids, um, a handful of us went on to do studio work because some people really like training. Um, training, is, it can be fun, uh, but it can be challenging. And some people absolutely do not like to be trainers. And if you love animals but don't want to train, a lot of times you'll go to a zoo or to a rescue or to a rehab or do outreach where you don't really have to train very much. You're just carried for and working with the animals. Um, but I really enjoyed training. Um, when I was doing it, I, 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 I just found, I loved the challenge. I got great, uh, uh, feeling after knowing that this seeing an animal and I, and I trained rats and birds and all kinds of different animals. I didn't train any dogs, believe it or not, when I was in school. Um, but there was something very satisfying about taking an animal that couldn't do anything, right? It was just an animal. And after I put in time and energy, all of a sudden I had an animal that was able to do things because of me. And that was a great feeling. I really enjoyed that. Are they, is it a pretty competitive industry in the sense that like, man, you're one of, if you're applying for a new trainer job, you're one of a, how many people going for this? Or it's like, boy, we can't find people. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the industry is like right now. I, I don't, I know it is, it's fairly competitive because this is an industry that, that can be um, pretty financially rewarding. Um, a lot of animal stuff tends to be pretty low pay. Um, so zookeeping, animal care, they tend to not pay very much because uh, so many people want to do the job. However, I think the industry as a whole can only support so much. Uh, there's only so many productions that have animals in them. And so that really limits the amount of trainers that can be hired by companies and work at any given time. Um, especially, you know, 20 years ago, this was a completely different industry. Before there was computers, every animal was a, was a practical animal on set. There were tigers, there were elephants, there were bears, there were things. And now, aside from dogs, almost all exotics, are computer generated in some way because you just have so it's a lot cheaper and you have a tremendous more amount of flexibility in what you can do. Yeah, so, that I mean that makes especially with some exotic animals like quite frankly I don't want a tiger on the <laughs> right like let's CGI yeah. that. Yeah. Right, I mean and that's the way it's gone and, and CGI has gotten so good now um, that I I can bear I can tell I can tell as a trainer most of the time just by the action because I'll know there's no way that a, a real animal would have done that or that they would allow a real animal to do that thing. Um, so what they'll do a lot now too is instead of hiring an exotic for the entire production, they'll hire the exotic and do like some some in-studio green screen work and some motion capture work. And then they'll translate that and you know turn it into a whole film. Do you guys work a lot with exa- exotic animals or is no. it more dogs, cats? No, our company, our company, Hollywood Paws, we only do domestic animals, just domestic. So no exotics. Uh, our, our bread and butter is just dogs. We don't do cats. Um, we do small animals and some other stuff as those jobs come up, um, rabbits and birds and some stuff like that. But our, our bread and butter by far is dogs. 
They're the most used. And, and watch, watch TV, watch movies, watch commercials. You'll see, you know, you'll see 10 dogs before you see one snake or one mouse or one rat. They're just, you know, they're the most used domestic animal. So it's, it's where if you want to work. That's the animal you should have. Yeah, I would think that dogs would probably be the easiest too. Yeah, they they are because they're the they're the ones that like to work, right? All the the, the exotic animals they'll work because they're food motivated. They'll work because uh, uh, of their their training and everything else. Dogs want to please, you know. Cats not not so much, you know. Yep. But how, I guess how do the animals generally handle it, right? Can you tell looking at it like this dog is all about it, and this dog is just it's yeah. not it's not happening. So, Absolutely. So, so there are some definite prerequisites that, that we tell people who are considering getting into this. Um, the, the main ones that, that we go to are confidence and food drive. Those, those are the two absolute most important. Um, confidence is pretty obvious and straightforward. Working on set, you're working with strangers and loud noises and new people and new environments. And if you've ever gone up to a dog and you've gone to pet it and it kind of pulls away, you know, does that shy thing. Nope, don't not not a good not a good candidate at all because it, we never want to put a dog in a position where they're unhappy, where they're they're scared, where they're nervous, and and that's not nothing you ever want to do. So confidence is number one. Uh, second one is food drive. Um, everything that a dog does on set is voluntary. Um, so if you picture a scene, you picture a dog, you picture Fra- the dog from Frasier, Eddie. That dog is in the middle of a scene sitting in a chair, you know, being asked to do things by a trainer. There's nobody there to make that dog do anything. You know, that dog is supposed to bark at a certain line and then lay down and then go pick up a toy and get back in the chair, whatever the action is. No one's there making that dog do that. The dog's doing that on its own because it wants to. And and dogs like to work, but they they need something to make sure they're motivated, and that's food. I feel like that's us too, though, when you get right down to it. Oh, yeah, exactly. Substitute food for a paycheck, which equals food. Yeah, same same thing. You're not going to dig a ditch for, for a dollar an hour in the hot sun, and a dog is not going to work on set for 12 hours for a, a, a tennis ball. Has the industry changed in a way? Like, What kind of protections are in place for the animals to make sure that people aren't the there are several protections um i i'd like to think the first and foremost is is us the trainers um it is not in our best interest or anyone's best interest to push a dog on set to a point where they no longer want to work because that doesn't benefit anybody right um once a dog is is scared or or pushed to the point where it doesn't want to work anymore nobody benefits from that we now have a dog that's not going to want to work on set so that burns us for all future jobs for that dog and the production its day is over with the dog oh we still have more scenes well it's too bad the dog doesn't want it, won't do it anymore and like i said earlier it's voluntary so we can't make the dog do it um as far as other safeguards there are uh companies like american humane and map which stands for moving animals protected and their sole purpose is again to just be there on set and to to help us as trainers mediate any any issues we may have or any any things that we may have may have not noticed or things that they can just help us with um things like you know making sure the asphalt isn't too hot and helping us you know say okay you know we can only do this scene one more time because the you know the sun is just getting too hot or or whatever there's not enough shade in this scene and so they're there to help us um uh, make sure that no animals are harmed and everything else. But again, it starts with the trainer. It starts with us. And and again, it's in no one's best interest um, to to make a dog be scared or or be hurt or be you know it doesn't help anybody. I, I've never understood why uh, people like think that working on set is is some sort of an abusive industry because it's it's literally the opposite. It's one of the few industries that is all voluntary. You know, there's no leashes there. You know, the, the dog does what it wants when it wants. And if it doesn't want it, it doesn't do it. It's as simple as that. Has, has that always been the case? Or do you feel like that's kind of changed over the last whatever amount of time? Uh, as far as like exotic animals and some of those other ones, I think that there were probably some, some unfortunate things that were done earlier on. And I'm, I'm you know, sure if people Google it, they'll find things. Um, but with domestic dogs, it's it's not really the case and and with exotics again it's just not that way anymore boy if you get that pr hit 
somebody finds out that that oh, yeah. crush you, that'll crush absolutely. you fast. Absolutely. I, and it, and it happened with whatever movie that was, a, a dog's purpose or a dog's life, whatever that was. And there was there was some video that that was edited to look like the dog was was really struggling to swim, and that was enough to absolutely dismantle that whole, you know, killed everything about that production. So again, it's in no one's best interest to even do things that are perceived. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Absolutely. Most in demand dog. Family dog. That that's the general fit. Golden lab terrier mixes. Um, sort of that the generic dog that you can't really tell what it is. Those are by far the most in demand. By far. Least. Least is a, a variety. Least right off the bat. Um, solid black dog. If you've ever tried to take a, a, a cell phone video or a picture of a solid black dog, what happens? Same thing happens with my shirt. You can't see anything. It all blends together. There's no definition. There's no, you can't see it. So solid black dogs and darker dogs are, are almost never picked. Um, you can't ever say, never say never because there is a black dog in a movie. But I mean, overall, very rarely picked. Um, the other one is sort of the, the white fluffy dog. I'm sure you've seen lots of little white fluffy dogs in your life. For some reason, they're almost never picked for studio work. I don't know why. I would think that they would be picked. It seems like the kind of, like, I feel like there's always, I think of uh, Jennifer Coolidge seems like someone yeah, who would be. Right. You, yeah, I mean, but watch, watch TV and movies and we, we have them. They have not, they just typically are not picked. You'd think maybe they would be, but they they are not. I mean, so same thing with like, there are purse dogs, we call them purse dog or whatever, uh, productions out there where you know we uh, we did like the some of the advertising for legally blonde legally blonde on Broadway and so we we brought Chihuahuas and things like that because that was the dog, um, but that's sort of an exception. You know those those dogs are are not really highly sought after, um, just because they 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 portray a look that just for whatever reason again I don't know why I'm not the one who picks the dogs or or decides what goes in what they just don't work very much. Yeah, that's one of those things that even thinking about is like, well, why wouldn't that dog work? Yeah, I yeah, your guess is good. My Bichon Frises and Maltese mixes and all those things, we see them all the time. People contact them all the time, but they just don't work. Most unique command you've ever had to teach in a dog or an animal? Oh, that is that is a good. That's a great question. Two two come to mind. Um, our company was contacted uh by a reality show uh, about uh it was called um guinness world records unleashed um it was a tv show about people breaking guinness world records and spoiler alert reality shows are often not real sorry if i'm breaking hearts out there it's it's more scripted than you would ever believe it is um and so we were hired as a as a studio company to train animals to break records um, one of them was removing socks and shoes. And so one of our trainers, um, Brianna Messerschmidt, she has two Guinness World Records since she was a trainer on the job for most socks uh, removed by a dog in 60 seconds and most shoes removed by a dog in 60 seconds. And she was on the Katie Couric show and promoted it and everything else. And it was, uh, but the, uh, the thing, we, she was hired to do it and, and paid as a, as a studio trainer to do it. So that, that's fairly unique. How many... How many socks and shoes was it? Like I would be impressed at two, to be honest. With right. You. Uh, it was a it was a lot, and it was we. She ran out of people. I want to say it was like it was it was like thirteen people. So so thirteen times two sets of socks and shoes, and she had at least fifteen seconds left. But since there weren't any more people on there, she broke the record with that amount. They they set it up so she'd break the record, not that she would set a new record. So once she broke the record with those thirteen people on the Katie Kirk show back when she used to have a talk show. Um, that was it. That was it. I can't believe reality TV oh, show. I, is it's, slightly... it's just it's amazing. Terrible. Sorry, they... Bachelor Nation. <laughs> Actor that seems to get along best with animals. Oh, um, most most of them almost because who doesn't love dogs? You know what I mean? Like when you show up on set and you have an animal, you're the you're the I'm oftentimes the, you know, the best person that people like to see on set purely because I have the dog that's there. So, um, 
the only time that I've ever had an issue was we, like I said earlier, we provide other animals and, and we have provided um, snakes and things like that. And that's where people start to not like when we show up. And so um, uh, I did uh, an episode of the new adventures of old Christine with Julie Louise Dreyfus, that, that show Wanda Sykes was on that show. And she wanted, abs- if I was in the studio, she did not want to be in the studio. And I, I tried not to take it personally. Um, but it was because she was just absolutely terrified of snakes. Yeah, everybody does like dogs. Yeah, especially when they're nice, right? Like, yeah, and and we don't right, and we don't bring not nice dogs. Even when the dogs are supposed to look mean, or they're not really mean, you know. It's all it's all training, you know, like the barking and the growling and the snarling, um, or you know, being afraid or whatever. That's not none of that's real. It's all it's all we it's all things we do to make it look real. I think they added sound. We use little devices and things like that. Um, you know, some of the friendliest dogs, you know, can look really scary on set if you get them to bark just right. <laughs> most famous TV dog or most famous, I guess, who would you say is kind of like that was the most famous dog? Oh, um, it may have been because I already mentioned it, but uh, uh, the dog from Modern Family, despite there being two dogs, um, and then Eddie from Frasier, I think are the most two well-known TV dogs. Is I there think, a... Because they... They did so many seasons, you know, season after season, and the dog was just sort of always in the background and reminded you it was there, um, you know. And there's been other dogs in TV shows, but I think purely for the runtime of those series, those dogs really stood out. The one that jumps out to me, right, is like Air Bud, right, because they made a ton of them. Well, now, yeah. will that be the same animal the whole time? No. So for for movies like Air Bud. Um, we'll oftentimes we'll get doubles for things like that. Like the, the classic case um, is like Marley and me, um, you know, during the movie Marley and me with, uh, you know, Owen yeah, Wilson yeah. and I think, yeah. Um, they were famously 22 yellow labs in that, in that movie. So that's, a, that's a lot, you know, and it's because there was so many different actions that those dogs were doing. The dog was mellow. The dog was old. The dog was young. The dog was, destructive the dog was pulling on leash the dog was asleep and and it can be so difficult to get a dog that is just crazy energy to pretend to be asleep all the time that they just got a, a bunch of them they got a bunch of backups they got a bunch of doubles um and yellow labs are easy because all yellow labs kind of look alike um if it was a mutt in that thing it would that would have been impossible because you can't find that many that can double each other and you can and, and be able to tell and then how would they do that? Then they would just like anytime they really showed the face, they would just like, this is the face dog. Um, it's more so more so the action. This is the this is this is the hyper dog. This is the crazy high energy ball drive dog. And this is the very low energy, mellow sleeps. You know, the, the all the scenes where the dog is not doing things, they use that dog. And all the scenes where the dog is dragging owen wilson down the street and ripping up the the sofa that's the hyper dog who would you say like could you say like who's like the best acting dog like oh man that dog did the best job of like yeah. acting the dogs are all the dogs are doing is what the trainers have taught them to do right so that's that's what the dogs are doing there no there's no so in other words we get a lot of times where the the script will say the dog is sad or the dog is this, the dog is scared. Um, we don't ever make a dog be scared on set. We, we don't actually make a dog scared on set. We do things like teach a dog to lower their head and back up. And on camera, all of a sudden, that looks like a scared dog. That do- Oh, that dog entered a room, lowered its head, made a whimpering sound and backed out slowly. To me, that looks like a scared dog. You know, but that's not, that's not really what happened. There wasn't any fear involved at all. There was very, very specific training. That dog was probably loving every second of that. And a lot of times we have to work to get the dog's tail to stop wagging because it's like, it's supposed to be scared, but the dog is so happy to be, to work and to be on set and to be around people that its tail's wagging. And so we have to work and make sure the tail's like not wagging actively in these seats. Um, so again, there's, there isn't any, you know, acting emotions that the dog is is displaying it's all it's all training and and there are there are more you know examples of great trained dogs than i that i could even list you know um the the dogs that are in that that uh that 
TV show, The Old Man. There's a couple of Rottweilers on oh, that yeah, show. Yeah, He's yeah. got those those dogs are fantastic. You know, um, very well trained. They looked aggressive. They looked scary, but at the same time, they also looked amazingly sweet. They're Jeff Bridges' personal dogs that are loving and cuddling and doing all these things. So I think that's amazing acting. You know, those dogs are actively, believably looking like they're ripping people to shreds, and then the next scene, they're they're actively cuddling with with actors. This one might be out of the realm necessarily, but maybe you know the answer. Um, has there ever been an animal that was cast? And I think they probably mean an, an exotic animal. That, like, we want yeah. this, but yeah. ah, we just couldn't do it. The, the thing that would come to my mind, like, we want to make this movie with a koala bear, but uh, oh. we just couldn't do it. You're def- I don't know anyone who has a working panda. No, n- nobody owns one. You, you know, Companies can't get one. So if that was something that somebody wanted to do in a – in a writer's room, hey, we want a show and we're going to build it around this panda as a main character. I mean, it might be able to be done if someone was willing to commit to it, but it's not something that a company has that we could then train and, you know, it's just not really feasible. So there may be a situation like that that's existed, um, but I don't know because it probably stopped dead in its tracks. It, you know, somebody went, oh no, that's prohibitively expensive. Just make it a make it a chinchilla rather than a koala and we'll go from there. And we never heard about it. That's pretty much all the questions I got, man. Is there anything else you think that we missed or, you know, how can people mo- learn more about you, about the company? Um, sure. I, I mean, I, I can do a little blur about it ourselves. Um, so our company is Hollywood Paws. Um, uh, you can go on our website. If, if people have a dog that they think would be a good fit, you know, it fits the criteria that I talked about. It's confident. It's food driven. It's got a look um, that, you know, is a family dog or a terrier. Mega. It looks like something that, that you have seen on TV or, or you know, if it's a look you'd like, you know, people can reach out and we would be happy to give them honest feedback as far as their dog's potential. And, and, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's not required that anyone take our training or anything else. All that we require to be able to represent a dog and take them on set is that they just have to be studio trained. Um, where they get the training really doesn't matter to us. We, we have programs that we can help them because it is so unique and most people don't know how to do it. Um, but all they have to do is be trained and we will, happily take them on set and work them and the the owner will will get the money that we charge for for the studio and rental so it's a great way to make money and it's a really fun uh fun way to to bond with your dog and do some unique training and so you know to all the people who you know love agility and love doing all these extracurriculars if you're looking for something else fun to do studio training can be fun regardless of whether your dog works or not because it's it's very unique stuff that's done in a unique way um, that is unlike any other type of training that's out there. That's why I like. Do animals seem to like you? Uh, yes, but only I, I have this theory that animals only like humans because they know what we are. We give them food. We take care of them. That's the only reason why they why they don't eat us and kill us. I would say that most animals either think that they're going to get something from us or are afraid of us. I don't think any of them them are just friends with us out of the kindness of their own heart they're not any different than us though i mean we behave the exact same way that they do i always wonder though about animals is that do they know that they could take over the planet like do they know the power that they that they hold if they wanted to possess it well they couldn't take over the planet they have a physical power but that only gets you so far right we have thumbs they don't have thumbs man (laughs) <laughs> we don't have to worry about them that much. Dude. Like individually, yeah, if we're in a battle arena, they're going to take us out. But as a collective, like there's not much that they can do with us. Wasn't there that uh, that, that study or whatever that came out that said there's like 8,000 ants to every human? Yeah, but that just doesn't – I'm not really too worried about the ants taking over. What animal would you say you're most worried about taking over? insects because uh, of how many there are i mean right it's pretty easy to say that which ones won't take over i mean fish won't take over birds probably won't take over i mean i can't really see any land animals taking over the only land animal i could really see taking over is crows i'm a little bit worried about because they're smart now, but see, again, they don't have thumbs. We don't really have to worry about anything that doesn't have thumbs. <laughs> I don't, I, I, maybe, I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not appreciating the thumb. I, I don't know. I think you're vastly underestimating the importance of the thumb. 
because you can't hold on to things very well without the thumb. And I, I, I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie. I probably put ants as a top three animal that I would be worried about. The only animal that I'm slightly worried about besides crows is maybe just dolphins. I just don't really trust dolphins. I feel like that whole thing that they're putting on about being like, oh, we're just following boats, we're playful, we're nice to look at, we're helpful. (laughs) I think that's all an act. We don't know what's going on down there. I think dolphins are overrated animals. I really do. I, I think they are like elephants to me. Whoa. They are overrated. Elephants are not overrated. Elephants, I think, are right where they should be in the sense that, like, look, they have emotions. They care for each other. Elephants are fantastic. I'm not I'm not saying they're not fantastic animals. I just feel like they're like penguins. Okay, so what animal do you think is underrated then? Like, oh, we should be making a bigger deal about that. Because right now all I'm hearing you doing is hating on certain animals. <laughs> I mean, that is true. I was kind of negative there for two minutes. Uh, I mean, jaguars, cheetahs, lions, tigers. I mean, animals that are, are predators. Hmm. I'm a big fan of the wolf. I think the wolf, the wolf needs needs a lot more respect in this world. Don't think the wolf gets enough ever, respect. Have you ever seen a wolf in, in the wild or like at the zoo? I mean, I've seen it at the zoo. I've seen a couple at the zoo. They're much bigger than you think that they would. Oh, they're, Yeah, they're, that's what I was going to They're huge. Like, if one was to roll up on me while I was at a, having a campfire in the middle of the woods, I would probably be quite worried. I'm I'm pretty much afraid of any wild animal. If you're any in a wild animal that is bigger than a squirrel, I don't want anything to do with messing with them. Cuz you're going to be on the losing side of that battle. I really don't want to mess with any animal, not even a squirrel. Like if a squirrel attacked you, could you do, like you're basically just going to have to run away. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is because they're so quick, right, that you're probably not going to get a whole lot of offense in. And they're going to fuck you up by the time that you even get a a good grip on them. By that time, they're jumping off you and leaving. Right. They're going to just run circles around you and then just, like, (laughs) bite you with those teeth. I mean, they can crack nuts, man. That's going to hurt. That's what's interesting is that we beat every animal but not – individually like unarmed we're gonna lose to pretty much anything over five pounds it is incredible thinking of what animals like i said what they could do if they knew the limits of what they could do i mean what's to stop a rhino from taking out every safari car in africa i want to say that i read something that like before we became intelligent enough to start using tools we were like middle of the pack i'm always curious and to know that if dinosaurs hadn't have gone extinct, where would we be as a species right now? Not existing? Yeah, I don't think we would be. I don't think a lot of species would exist, though, to be honest with you. But we certainly would not be existing. I mean, let's be honest, though. Comes to dinosaurs, some of them had their problems. Well, I don't think that they had a lot of problems besides the fact that there was a giant meteor. I think that's ultimately the only real problem that they had. If I was a dinosaur, like, watching us, I'd be like, all right, they're pretty okay, but let's see what they do in the long run, right? (laughs) We don't have anything on dinosaurs right now. Yeah, we've got all this technology, but we're a flashy young kid. We haven't established ourselves as a dominant organism on the planet. I think we are the dominant organism, but I agree with you. We're still, like, the – we're still in the infancy – of humanism, I would say. Can that, I just say that? I don't think that's correct. But we can just we can just skip so. infancy. Infancy, I yeah. believe, is the word. I think infancy is the word. That's right. Oh, that's the right word. Yeah, maybe you just didn't say it quite the way. That infancy. I... Yeah, infancy. Infant. <laughs> I think the actual dominant organism on the planet is either viruses or fungi. It's their, oh yeah, by far. It's their planet. We just happen. They're like letting us like (laughs) we'll just let them have it as they feed on us. I mean, 
we just went through a pandemic, and now that Last of Us show is showing everybody that fungi could kill us if the <laughs> if the wrong one gets out of control. Um, we actually, if anybody is interested in this, we had a fungi expert on a while ago, Doctor Gordon Walker, and he we talked about the the idea of the fungi thing in The Last of Us, and he said basically no, that's that would not happen. They're not adapted to our immune systems. But um, anyway, if anybody wants to listen to it, it's really interesting. Well, it's because we're too hot from what I understand. Yeah, but even if we weren't too hot, we there would still be a lot of difficulties. He explains the whole thing. If anybody's interested, we'll put a link into it. Um, yeah. Okay. You ready? The November 3rd, 2021 edition of Profoundly Pointless is when we had Dr. Gordon Walker on. Holy crap. Man, time goes fast. It's fascinating to me how long days are and how short years are. Yeah, it's kind of like you in the bedroom. Um, well, what's the long part? I, I didn't. I didn't think that one that far out. Yeah. I didn't. See, either way, you kind of complimented I me didn't. in a way. But before I get in the shots, I want to ask your. Opinion That's a on one question. Thing. One thing: Would you rather have a big old honker or last really long in the bedroom? Like, you could last really long, but you've got slightly substandard, like four to, to five. Or you could have a 10 oh. to 12, but you're only going like two minutes. Am I my age now, or am I like 21 years old? Let's say 25 to 40. Oh, well, if I'm that, yeah, then I'm going, I'm going length over, yeah. over longevity at that point. Right. Right, it's ready to big a. It's better to make a big splash than a long wave. <laughs> yeah, it's better to you know instead of wad you know waddling into the pool, just fucking cannonball, get right. it over with. Just sh- show them. Men and women alike are impressed by that. Nobody's impressed if like I went for two hours and be like why. Yeah, and half the time you don't even believe, at least from a, from a man-to-man perspective, you don't believe I, the guys that are bragging. I don't believe anybody that talks about it. Anybody that says anything about their um, sexual escapades, I don't believe any of it. <laughs> I would say it's I only believe ones. 10% about it. 10% tops of anybody okay. that's telling me anything. Like, man, I was there for like, no, you weren't. It was like 30 <laughs> seconds and you were by yourself. <laughs> And they left disappointed, and you probably paid for it. Um, okay. Do you want to do shout-outs, or do you have some big question that you wanted to ask me? Uh, n- no, I wanted to get your opinion on something. So the wife and I were having an argument the other day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably one that, you know, I- I'm always to blame. So we'll say that I was at blame for the reason we were arguing. Okay, okay. And about halfway through the argument, it wasn't a long argument, but about halfway through, and she was, I mean, my wife was mad. Oh, it was like an argument uh, argument. The kind of argument oh, you probably shouldn't be talking about. Yeah, no, it, it's it's fine. It's, you know, I think any couple, whether you're married or not married, man, you know, man, female, whatever, whatever floats your boat. I think you get, in a, you get in arguments, you get in disagreements. It happens. I think it's healthy, actually. Maybe not to argue to the point. Uh, obviously, there shouldn't be physical violence. But, you know, arguing and disagreeing is normal. I think it's good. Anyways, long story short, we're we're arguing. It's more of a disagreement than an argument, whatever. Uh, but halfway through, I realized that this is dumb. You know, like what what we're talking about just it doesn't matter. So I proceed to make a really bad joke, like out of nowhere. And I thought that would do two things: one, make her stop and be like, "This guy's an idiot. I'm leaving the room." And two, for her to realize that I wasn't really mad. Well, I don't know what the Latin term is for this, but I done fucked up. Yeah, dude. I don't even need to know what it's about the sound that you done fucked up. I mean, most arguments, if you get halfway through it, it's kind of like, wait a minute. What are we even arguing about? Because then it becomes about winning the argument rather than actually (laughs) having a discussion about it. So what happened at the end of this? I mean, she she went to uh, she might have been at an eight at that point. She went to like an eleven and a half. What was the joke? And I just well, well, we need context here. What was the joke? What was the argument about? Uh, the argument was about plans for, <laughs> plans for the day, like what we were going to be doing. Okay, okay. What time uh, was the it, argument happening in the day? 
11 a.m. maybe. All right. That's a little late to be arguing about plans for the day, but not not totally out of the realm of understanding. I feel like that's a and 9 a.m. thing, but I am a morning person. I, uh, I, I have these jokes that I like to say. I make them up, but I say, like, things that my grandfather used to say, and they're really dumb. And, you know, for instance, like... Uh, just an example, I was, I'll say, hey, uh, you know, it's like my grandfather used to say, you can go fishing and, and catch that fish, but it doesn't mean the sun's going to set any faster. Oh, <laughs> right, right. Like it sounds like wisdom, but it's actually just a completely pointless thing to say. Oh, it's, it's, it's meaningless, bold, like, but you do think about it for a brief moment. Yeah. Well, I did one of those to her, and for about about a quarter of a second, I saw her go, Oh, and then it was just seeing red. Oh, and then, yeah. you know, so my 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 reason in saying this was to all of you out there who are listening to this, don't do what I did. Just keep going. Try to win the argument. Don't try to end it with a very bad joke. That's only going to infuriate your partner even more. Hmm. I don't know if that's actually I think that your strategy could have worked. You just got to read you should have read the room better. I would say that strategy would actually work like 8 at least 8 out of 10 times, but you didn't read the room very well. For for the record, just so everyone knows how this ended, within an hour of that, I was making her food and lunch for her and my children. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Anyways. Then. Yeah, thanks for, for nothing. Um, all right, uh, let's give some shout-outs. Uh, we'll start with Jamie Clay, Charlie Dupin, Rachel Baggett-Moore, Jennifer Finley, Lena Mariposa, Lloyd White, Bill Burrow, Daryl Rodriguez, Sasha Boney, Corey Grundman, and last but not least this week, Sashin Patil. Mm. Don't hear a lot of Charlies anymore. It's a good, solid mm. name. I'm not a fan of Charles, unless it's Charles Xavier. But mm. Charlie's a Charlie's a solid name. That you don't usually have a lot of problems with people named Charlie. It's funny you say that, Nicholas. Because I was just, we, me and the wife are working our way through the Crown. The and obviously, Prince Charles is heavily into that. And I asked her, I go, you know, because he's going to have his coronation either this summer or or next year. And I said, watch, Charlie's going to become a top five boy's name again. Mm, so did it? I, I don't know. He hasn't had his coronation yet. Well, yes, he has. No, he hasn't. Who's Wait, is this a fictional TV show or is this a real thing? Who's Charlie? Is Charles, this in the show Prince, or is this in real life? It, <laughs> okay. You know that the queen died, right? I'm aware of the queen died, right? But is it yes. Will or Henry next in line? No. Who's it goes, Meghan Markle's husband? <laughs> is that Harry. Harry? Harry is fourth in line after... After his father, Charles, and then it goes to Charles' oldest son, William, and then to his three kids. Actually, Harry is fifth because it's—I don't even know the kids' names, but they have three children. So, who's going to be uh, the who's going to be the king now? Charles, in the TV show or in real life? Jesus Christ! In real life, he will be the king, but he. It's like a it's it's oh. like a year and a half to two year process of this coronation. So right so now we he, could we could just take over England because they got no, no ruler. We could no, just go in there. No, here we Time go. to start no, storming see, the beaches. See, <laughs> I'm fascinated by the mon. I think the monarchy gets gets rough shot because I feel like people don't want to learn the historical value of a monarchy. Um, and I, that's fine, but I'm fascinated by it. I could I could read on it and, and watch things on it all day. I think it's in some ways everybody's dream to essentially be born into wealth and power and not have to do anything. Weren't you a history major? Ancient Roman history, which is very <laughs> useful. I really put that degree to work, let me tell you. Okay. I've, that's um, – all right. 
I'm glad to. My hair has two and a half degrees, and I have no idea what I do with them. Uh, all right. Uh, would you rather have? Let's get to some questions. Okay. Some okay. Questions. Would you rather have wings or a fin? Wings. What would I do with one? I don't want to swim underwater. I don't care about being able to swim underwater. I would much rather have wings, assuming that I can fly. I don't want to be like an ostrich or a penguin or a turkey, <laughs> no, really. You, I want to be able dude, to Dude, you would for sure be like a little rock hopper penguin. A oh, thousand God. Percent. I would be a rock hopper penguin, too. Just and I'd just be out. that fat emperor penguin that just stands on the rock and everyone's like, look at that one. Look at that one. What's he doing? <laughs> eating, getting eaten by a polar bear. Yeah, no, I'd much rather have wings. I don't want to be in the water. Hey, you, you, you have to be honest, though, that if, if I was a penguin, I mean, they're coming after me because I'm definitely being plentiful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're going to get you yeah. pretty quick. They're going to get you pretty <laughs> quick. Think, this kind of goes back like to what we were talking about originally. Do you think we'll just take penguins as an example? Do you think there's like like penguin chatter where they're like, "Look at that one," like O'Brien is not escaping, you know, the polar bear today? That's a good question. Is if penguins size each other up the same way that we do? I bet they also. I wonder if they do. If they look at other animals and be like, "God, here comes freaking Brian." You see that idiot the other day? I yeah, hope right. that animals gossip. I hope that animals, I mean, other animals know like, well, they do in a way, right? They have competitions for who is going to be the alpha male and where they're going to be in packs, at least like wolves and dogs do. So they yeah, kind of figure I mean, things out that way. They know who's who's got it and who it doesn't. I mean, that's why they go to a water cooler, right? Like in Africa, they all go to a body of water, not because they're thirsty. No. No, I, because... Well, probably because sizing they're... each other up. I think that they probably don't do it in the same way that we do it. We do it through more through conversation. They do it more through physical shows of physical violence. But I think that they absolutely do it, right? They know that old Tommy over there ain't shit. Like he's not gonna <laughs> mess with Big Bob. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think. Yeah. I think we'll just move. move on. I can... That's a good question. I hope they do. I hope they have, like, they're chatting about each other. Yeah, dude, they socialize. I, I feel like that should just be my second question because this one isn't going to be very, very good. Um, but what, what would you rather have as a defense mechanism if you were an animal? Being able to uh, camouflage like a chameleon, have uh, gigantic, massive teeth like an alligator, or be able to spit venom? I don't really want anything to do with spitting things. Any kind of like spitting stuff or acid or venom or poison. I don't really want anything to do with that. I don't want to really okay. bite things either. What was my third option? Uh, I mean, this is the one you're going to pick. Just camouflage. Oh, like camouflage, a million yeah. grasshoppers. Yeah, you know? that'd be cool. Like camouflage animals, you're always, even if you don't like that kind of an animal, Whatever it is, you're always a little bit impressed by the fact that they can camouflage themselves. Like, I don't care anything about octopi, but the fact that they can, like, trend, they can change camouflage. I don't care about chameleons, but they are kind of memorable for that. Or, like, those animals. I care that, about how octopuses taste, I'll tell you that. I don't think I've ever had an octopus. I don't really want to. They're very smart. <laughs> I don't want to eat any yeah. animal. That's an animal that could take over the world, man. Think of they got yeah, that's an animal that's a threat. Except they're not plentiful. Well, I mean, who knows? We've talked about who knows where the who the, knows where they are. The man. There could like... be octopi plotting at the bottom of the ocean right now, and they might not have thumbs, but they've got eight arms, and they're gonna wreck us. We gotta watch them. All we right. gotta watch the octopi. You have to, you know, in in Detroit, uh, back in the late nineties, early two thousands, when the Detroit Red Wings, which is a hockey team. For those of you that don't know, uh, would do well or score a goal or something. People, for some reason, would throw an octopus onto the ice. Uh, they would sneak them in in their pants, in their bags, and underneath their shirts, and they would throw them onto the ice. That sounds awful for everyone involved. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, th this one's pretty easy. So the four four things uh, that we put up for us to discuss: uh, alligator killing an elderly woman in Florida. And now they're going through uh, where she was killed and, and, and finding all the alligators and disposing of them, which 
I don't know if I agree upon, but whatever. Uh, I mean, I, say that didn't I don't win. think that you can blame an animal for being an animal. Bare minimum Monday. Have you, have you heard of bare minimum Monday? Is that where you put in very little to no effort? <laughs> Yeah, work. apparently it was. It's something that just started, and it's of of course by the younger generation. Um, and it's basically you just don't really do any work I, on Monday. I don't feel sorry for any corporations because I feel like they are now experiencing what they have done to people for a long time. Right? They used to. They for how long have corporations been charging us more money for a crappier product? And now they want to get all sure. mad when people don't want to, like, well, wait a minute. I'm going to do less work for this amount of money, right? So we're just sure. doing to corporations what they have done to us for a long time. So I don't want to hear it. You ask a lot of underlings, a lot of people who are, are the workers for these corporations, and uh, there's a lot of unhappiness. That's for sure. Because we have come to the point that, like, all of this is getting us nowhere, there's no loyalty sure. amongst corporations. They could care less about you. So sure. why should we care about them? And they're pocketing all of this massive amount of money and then turning around and like, well, why don't you guys want to work for us? I've always thought the stupidest question that you could possibly ask somebody is why do you want to work here? For money. This is a job. Nobody cares about any of this. We want people who want to work here. No one wants to work here. I don't understand this <laughs> delusional mindset that some places have that like people want to be doing these things. We don't want to do this. It's for money. And don't get mad at us that we're now treating you the same way that you have treated us. We're going to charge you more money for the same thing. Well, I'm not doing more work for the same money. There's my rant wow. for the day. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to move on from that and say that the winning topic <laughs> uh, was cocaine bear. Oh yeah, of course it has to be cocaine bear. But the problem is, is like that movie to me. I want it. I don't want to see that movie. I want it to exist only in my head because my imagination of what's going on in that movie is probably better than the actual movie. I feel like the actual movie is a disappointment. Like Hot Tub Time Machine, sounds fantastic. <laughs> don't want to see the movie. Well, I mean, obviously it's a fictionalized version of a of a true story. But I don't know if you've taken the time to read the true story of Cocaine Bear, which, by the way, almost dethroned the Marvel movie at the top of the box office this week, uh, weekend, past weekend. Um, yeah, I think everybody's tired of those movies, man. Well, I mean, there's only so many ways they're different, right? And I got to tell you, I think uh, the actors that they put into the main roles, I think people are tired of them uh, because that's all, you've, that's all you've seen the last decade. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of overexposure basically happening with everybody because now every single celebrity has a movie or a TV show or an album and then they've also got all of their social media and then they're covered endlessly. Like, God, I just want something different. I'm sick of all these same people. I mean, listen, you know I love The Rock. You know it. Well, he's on a downfall. He's going down a little what bit. What he's doing... With the XFL, where every tweet is about this or every, basically every, and I get what he's doing. He's the head of it, but it's, man, it's, you, you know, I don't it. care about a backup quarterback from Alabama that couldn't make it in the NFL. So you gave him a shot in the XFL and he's won a game. Like I, you know. Yeah. Know. It's like, I'm not really that interested in people who are still pursuing that career in the XFL. I get it. Like more power <laughs> to him. Like try to fulfill your dream. But the idea that everybody's going to watch that, like. All right. Like, people aren't lining up in droves to go see high school basketball games for people that they don't know. I mean, let's be honest, though, right? I mean, it's great um, and good for them, but it's it's just part of that fatigue, I think. And I think the pandemic made it even worse for people because you were inside, right? And yeah, you just re you relied on these people's socials and everything else. Anyways, let's move on from that. Are you ready? I've, I kind of was under the impression you may have forgotten, and I was going to verbally <laughs> chastise you. But so it is. No! This episode is airing. It's a new month. So you Watch. know what that means. Watch. Oh, Watch. yeah. It's time. <laughs> what is that sound supposed to be? I'm not really sure. I just got really excited because I, I, I got a good one. I got a good company. Well, I don't know if they're a good company, but I found a company. It's a brand new company. Okay, can I say uh, what it is? Yes, please. I'm sorry. All right, it's time. No, wait. 
I can't make a horse sound, but I'm okay. Imagine like a horse sound, like hoof beats, like the outlaw candle connoisseur rides again. It's time, candle of the month. All right, so check this out. Brand new company, uh, not brand new, but brand new to this podcast. Uh, can, you can you hold the microphone? Can you hold the microphone next to you so people can hear? Like, Sorry, I just got so excited. I know, I know. I was worried you were gonna like uh, yell in it. I know that's why I held it away because I didn't want to like drown it out. Uh, so, so company I've never featured in my whatever two and a half years so far um, of doing this, uh, but the company is called Otherland, and this is a little different than I've done. But there's it comes in a three pack, and uh, it's basically called the uh, the limited edition three pack is called Carefree Nineties. You get three cents, Dreamlight, Blue Jean Baby. And glass pop. My my personal favorite is blue jean baby because it literally smells like a pair of washed blue jeans. Which I don't know if 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 you've ever. Well, of course you have. You wash your jeans and you're taking them, you know, out of the out of the washer and they smell like they just smell like the detergent. They smell fresh. I don't have a sense amazing. of smell. That's fucking right. I I should every know that. Every time we five do this, years. every time. How ironic that our. One of our most popular segments is Candle of the Month and how good they smell, and I don't... This whole segment is a slap in my face. It really is. That's why, it really that's why is. I'm taking a, okay. why I'm taking a look. Anyway, uh, all right. No, I don't know what jeans smell like. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so anyway, so glass pop, uh, or gl- gloss pop, I'm sorry. Uh, it's strawberry gloss, hard candy, frosted rose. That's kind of the... Like the candyish one, obviously, uh, but Dreamlight is a close. It's a close number one to me. But it uh, basically think of like a juicy tangerine mixed with, um, I don't know, like like some kind of fruit other than a tangerine. But it's like 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 uh, like fuchsia. Like it's a like it's just good. Like it just makes you feel good. But either way, head over to Overland uh, or Otherland, not Overland, Otherland. Dot com check it out i don't know how long how much longer they're gonna have it on i mean i don't think i've said this too many times but like we, we don't get paid for this like i literally just get candles throw them out there um yeah i wish i had coupon codes because i would use them man so the yet. end of this always ends up with you hitting trying to hit up people for free stuff <laughs> i like I mean, it i have yeah, to that's yeah. my only problem with this i have a couple of questions here well i have one statement and then i have a question I can't actually imagine at all what a tangerine looks like. Can you imagine okay. what a tangerine looks like? I can only imagine oranges and peaches. I like if somebody was like, "What does a tangerine look like?" It looks like an orange, right? Like I can't picture mentally a tangerine at all. I mean, it's just a baby orange, right? Now I've had a tangelo. But if somebody be like, how do I know the difference? How do I? Because we have cuties, which are little tiny oranges that my sons like. We go through like a fucking bag a day. Um, But anyway, I can't mentally picture a tangerine. I can't mentally separate a tangerine from just a small orange in my mind. Certainly can't picture a nectarine. Don't even know what that looks like. (laughs) Okay. What's your question? Is a nectarine like a peach? Uh, Similar, I believe. Oh, yeah. The skin's a little bit different. Um, so it's called candle of the month, not candles of the month. That sounds like three candles. Comes in a three pack. Okay. Technically it's one big candle. But are they separate? They are separate. Okay. So then which one of those is the candle of the month? I don't want three candles of the month. It's a candle of the month, not candles of the month. I mean, I, I said it. My my favorite is the blue jean baby, which because it smells like a pair of blue jeans that just got out of the wash, you know. And it's just want to smother myself in it and just just now, not put it in the dryer. Do blue jeans smell like black jeans, or do jeans all smell the same regardless of color? See, I, I knew I knew you were going to do this. But then you yes, should have an answer je- ready. Jeans smell like jeans. Yes. Doesn't matter if they're blue or khaki. It, no, but you've always had this issue because apparently, for those of you that didn't know this about Nick, he apparently didn't know that blue jeans were called blue jeans in some, some I know areas. that they're called blue jeans. It's just pointless to call them blue jeans. They're jeans. I don't need the color reference on them. I'm not like, all right, I'm going to go put on my gray shorts. <laughs> I'm just going to put on good, shorts. 
you have made good points in the past that we don't say, hey, I'm going to put on my black jeans right. or my green jeans. Right. But they're blue jeans. I don't know, man. Dale Earnhardt Jr., making them famous. Well, I think they were famous long before Dale Earnhardt Jr., just to be honest with yeah. you. Um, okay, are you ready for our top five? I am. Uh, so our top five is top five movie animals. What's your number five? So I'm gonna I'm gonna start this off with a question. When you meant animals, did you mean like the specific character or the kind of animal? I meant the specific character. Okay. All right. Well, that's good then. Uh, all right. So my number five is uh, the shark from Jaws. Oh shoot! I forgot about the shark from Jaws. That's way up there, though. The yeah. only thing, the only reason that I wouldn't put the shark from Jaws quite as high is it doesn't have a name. If the shark was named, mm -hmm. I feel like it would be a little bit higher on the list. But that's very good. Well, I, I think that's its name is Jaws, technically. Oh, is it Jaws? I believe that's the name of the... Well, I mean, it's the nickname they give the shark, but I think that's the that ends up being the name of the shark. Okay. Okay. I could be wrong as well, but I don't think I am. Man, that might have to be higher then, honestly. I think <laughs> you may, it's have, a, it's a good you may one. have gone low on five. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, because it puts my number five to shame, which is Rocket Raccoon. <laughs> I think he's okay. coming up fast, right? I think a lot of the other movie animals that we were going to talk about are older, 10 to 20 years older in a lot of these cases. I think Rocket Raccoon is probably the most recent addition to this list that could make the top five. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have older ones. My, my number four actually is probably the youngest one I have in terms of how, how recent it's been released. And I have uh, Finding Nemo. Okay. I thought about Nemo. Now, wait a minute. Finding Nemo. Which one did you have, though? Do you have Nemo or do you have the dad? Or Dory. No, Nemo, the, the little guy the with the messed up fin. But isn't the dad more in the movie than Nemo? I wonder who has more screen time, Nemo or the dad? <laughs> I, I I honestly don't have any idea. I mean, I, mean, I would think probably the dad because he's searching, right? He meets the turtle. I think who's played by Ellen DeGeneres. I think that's the fish. I think that's Dory. Oh, that's oh yeah, no, that's Dory. That's right. Yeah, Turtle is like the hippie guy. My number four is King Kong. Okay, so I have him. I he was my number three. I I didn't want to have him back to back to you, but I have King Kong as my number three. Okay, I'll go right into my number three. Then it's Winnie the Pooh. Kind of animal is Winnie the Pooh? He's a bear. Oh. How do you okay. not know that Winnie the what did you think it was? But I mean I I don't what kind of bear is Winnie the Pooh? Is it's a, No, is it's a, a bear. Is it, is it a brown bear? Is it a black Does bear? Does it matter it, if somebody's like, oh, okay, well Winnie the Pooh turns out he's I'm sure he's a golden bear. I mean, are those real bears? Maybe I, he's like, a honey I don't know. bear. Wouldn't it make sense I'm, for him to be a honey bear? Okay, we have two I things mean, that we need to look up. What kind of bear is Winnie the Pooh? And what was the other one? I thought there was something I, else. Who oh, what more, was what was the shark time? from Jaws? No name. What kind? How? Who has more screen time in Nemo, the dad or the kid? <laughs> a bear is Winnie the Pooh. I bet he's a. What do you think he is? What do you think he is? I I don't know. I know. He's a bear. What kind of bear is he supposed to be? I don't know. Nobody has an answer. Because <laughs> I don't think he's an actual. He's a teddy bear. It's fine. We'll just call he's him a, a bear. He's a teddy bear. That's fine. How come nobody has an answer to what kind of bear Woody the Pooh is? Did you find out the one about the Nemo? No, I didn't look it up. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then what's your number? Ooh, I think <laughs> I I might surprise you. But you also might surprise me. What's your number two? Yeah, my number two is actually pretty lame, but it's a personal favorite, so I'm putting it on the list. And that's Free Willy. Huh. <laughs> Free Willy is definitely has the name recognition, but I don't think that anybody actually gives a shit about Free Willy, right? Like, you remember the name, but you don't actually care. You just remember that scene where it jumps over the thing. 
which was fucking incredible. But yes, I I agree with you. But it's a personal favorite, and I feel like it could be in, it could be a top four or five. I just boosted it a couple of couple spots. That's all. I think that on when you first, I think that that's one that jumps out at you. But then as you start to think of other characters, it just keeps moving down the list. In which I think okay. that if you honestly kind of once you start to think of other movie characters, I think it gets knocked out of the top ten. Once you really start you to think about it. One and two are probably pretty easy, but I don't want to put I don't want to make it easy. My number two is Simba. Oh. Right. Yeah. Now that you think about it, Simba from The Lion King, you're like, oh crap. No, I'm I'm kind of surprised that uh we didn't have four animals on our list. Which I'll get to in my honorable mention, I guess. At okay. least, at least, at least three of them. Uh, uh, man, um, What's your number two then? Oh, you put Free Willy. No. Who's your number one? To me, it's, it's yes. a very clear answer. When you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, it has to be. Who's oh, your number boy. one? I'm a little nervous now, to be honest with you, because uh, <laughs> I don't think I have who who you have. I have Lassie as my number one. Oh, first of all, it's not a movie. Isn't it a TV show? Well, I mean, it's 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 a well. No, I think they made movies with Lassie, but like it's everyone knows the name. I mean, it spans, you know, I don't it spans think so. cultures, I think generations. I think that's a reference that's lost out because I don't, I, I've never even seen Lassie, and oh, we're well, middle aged men, and I've never even seen it. It was black and white, which we know the name, but we don't actually remember the show. Well, I don't know how What's you your number one Mickey Mouse. Oh yeah, right. Fuck, that's the answer. Oh crap, yeah. Once you think about it, you're like, yeah. oh, it has to. It, yeah, it's Mickey Mouse. Yeah, I mean, it is. It just, it just is. But ironically, even though it's absolutely Mickey Mouse, you can't think of a single thing that like. There's not really a good movie that Mickey Mouse has done. I mean, You're like, oh yeah, that's obviously number one. But what's the movie that Mickey Mouse is in? I mean, Fantasia is good, right? But that's about it. This is where I think we get interesting. What's in your honorable mention? So, uh, Babe the Pig. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Air Bud. I think that people. That's one of those movies, though. I don't think anyone. Everybody knows of that movie. Nobody's actually seen it. <laughs> Air Bud. Yeah, have you actually watched it? Yeah, and some of the sequels. Airbud plays hockey. Airbud saves the president. So no is the answer that you you've never actually seen Airbud. I have I have seen it. You've watched Airbud, the whole movie. Yeah, once again because you want to put our ages out there. The first Airbud was released when we were, you know, it was right in our time to watch it late or early 90s, wasn't it? I have no idea. Uh, I mean, yeah. Who else you got? Uh, the Birds from the movie The Birds. Okay. A little bit before our time, but all right. Uh, the Spiders from Arachnophobia. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I feel like that's a movie where people are like, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. There's just too many spiders. There wasn't an individual spider. There needed to be an individual. <laughs> too many, man. Um. I mean, the the problem is, is like, oh, oh Flipper. Yeah. Like Flipper on the list. But even Flipper is one that's before our time. We know the name. We've never actually seen it. Wasn't there a whole, how do you make a whole TV show about a dolphin? Can you imagine I mean, being a writer in that show? Like, what are we going to do with the dolphin? How are we going to work the... <sighs> a lot of drugs, I would I would think. God, what are we going to have the dolphin do? We'll swim around? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you going to do with that? Uh, I mean, it really. I mean, Disney animals could be their own category. Yeah, really. they could run for a pretty while. I've got okay. How many more? What other anim- honorable mentions do you have? You, have you, you go ahead. I'm pretty much tapped out. Um, I had uh, Toto, Wizard of Oz. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Paddington Bear. Okay, that's also a good one. Remy from Ratatouille. Okay, never seen it, but I. Good. Does Chewbacca count? 
He's a Wookiee. I don't know if he's an actual animal and like a real animal. Well, hmm, that's the big question, right? Does Chewbacca count as an animal? Because he is his own species. We may view him like an animal, but he is a species that would be along our equivalency. But we are also animals. I feel like if we count Chewbacca as an animal, then we also have to count ourselves. Thereby kind of erasing the whole point of this entire thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> Where to give us legitimacy. 